Well, we want to welcome you to our GHCC at home service. And we're so thankful that you can join us and praise and worship God with us. Yeah. Make room for yourselves. Come on. Get ready to praise and worship. Put on your praise garment. Some of you might still have your pajamas or whatever yeah. you have on. But put on your praise garment and let us just praise the yes. Lord Come on. with everything inside of us. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, clap your hands together. Father, we're so grateful that you love us with an everlasting love. We give you praise, oh God.
of the place with the name of Jesus. Amen. There is nobody greater. There's no one stronger than the God that you and I serve. He deserves all the praise. So clap your hands together. Songs sing with us. I know, say, and I know, I know, I know, the Lord is good. I know, I know, I know, His love endures. Somebody say, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Hey, hey. Yes, I know, say, I know, I know, I know, that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. I know, I know, I know, His love endures. Thank you for your love and mercy, yes, God. oh God. Say it. 
victory in your name. Come on right there, we want to just fill the place with the name of Jesus. The Bible says when you say his name, he responds. And Lord, we need you to respond in our family. We need you to respond in our country. We need you to respond to God in every aspect of our lives because you hear our prayers and you hear our cries. Jesus. I'm Pastor Nevin. It's so wonderful to share the Word of God with you. And I'm mindful of the goodness and the blessing of God. In this time, God has supernaturally been providing for you and I. What a privilege it was to be able to supply food and to provide food for those in need and to be able to see every one of our leaders taken care of and our people in our congregation taken care of. And I want to thank so many of you who have so generously been giving to the Lord during this season. But I was reminded of Psalm 31, and Psalm 31 is a really significant psalm. It's the psalm of Jesus, it's really the life of Jesus, about the crucifixion. And it begins in verse 1 with saying, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Then when you go further in the psalm to verse 20, it says, You will hide me in the secret place of your presence from the plots of men. You will keep them secretly in the pavilion from the strife of tongues. You blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. I want you to know God is showing us marvelous kindness in a strong city. God is supplying our needs. This is a strong city. Many times when we talk about a city, we look at the location in which we live. But the Bible says we've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. When it says that, it says we've come to the house of God, to the place of praise, to the place of worship, to a place that is a fortress. The strongest and most secure place right now is to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The strongest and most secure place is to remind God of His promises. Here the psalmist is writing, and when he writes, he is writing about the crucifixion of Jesus. And yet, as he writes, prophetically he sees the future. And I believe that God is speaking to you and I that prophetically the future is better than what we are living in in our present. So many times we become so obsessed with what we are living in right now. But the psalmist begins by saying, I'm not going to be ashamed because God will hide me in the pavilion. He will hide me in his fortress. He will bless me. I want you to know that God has a thousand ways of blessing you. If He could send ravens to feed the prophets of God, God can send ravens to feed you. If He could supply manna in the wilderness, God can supply manna or food for you. The provision of God is a wonderful thing. It is an amazing thing how God provides for you. So many times we make light to the provision of God, but I want you to know God is a supernatural provider. Sometimes just in the little things, we see the hand of God. And that doesn't stop us praying big prayers, but in the little things, we see the provision of God. Answered prayers. This week we've been praying for many, and what a wonderful privilege. We've seen some of our young families and uh, they've just had children and how God's protected them in the hospital and they've come out of the hospital healthy and well. And when there's all bad news and doom and gloom, we see that children that are the heritage of the Lord are being born, families are being blessed. God has been providing for this wonderful congregation and God will continue to provide for you and I. So as we come to give to the Lord today, we don't put our trust in the arm of flesh. The Bible says some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Our trust is in God who supplies and provides for us. Our trust is in our Heavenly Father 
who supplies for us. And as we put our trust and our faith in Him, we believe there will be not one day when your electricity will be turned off, not one day when you'll be without food, not one day when you'll be in a desperate situation, but each and every day you'll see God's hand of provision. And even during this season, I believe that this is a season where there will be supernatural debt cancellation. That debt will just be canceled. Individuals will say, that was then. We know you can't go back so many months. We're going to supernaturally cancel debt. We're going to supernaturally forgive debt. We're going to supernaturally see that you're blessed. And so I believe during this season, not one of you will lose your home. And even those who've stayed away from work, that the doors will be, floodgates will be opened and you'll get a promotion. And God will give you a better job or replace you in the job you were in with a better salary. I believe this is a season where God is turning everything around. One thing is ended, but a new thing has started. That requires us to put our faith in the provider, our heavenly father, and he will provide for you. Before we give to the Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of you. And then we're going to worship the Lord. Now, Father, I thank you for these precious men and women that have joined us in this mighty congregation. And as a church, we have the privilege of taking care of the poor, the needy, the elderly, the young families, those that are in lack. And we thank you that you've given us the ability to be able to do this. So during this season, even as you've supernaturally provided for your people, so you will continue to provide for them. Multiply their seed sown. Bless every gift. I thank you that you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there is not room enough to contain. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord. Yes, Lord. We will see how 
privilege to share the word of God. I'm going to be speaking to you about your faith increasing and being established in God. Now, one of my favorite subjects and one of the things that I really love is where the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. And that is in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. And the beginning of Hebrews 11 says now faith is the substance. I'm always fascinated when I hear about faith because everything in life requires faith as I stand on this platform it requires faith that it'll sustain and hold my weight when I get in the car and I put the key in the ignition it requires faith that the battery will turn the starter and the car will start and the vehicle will go so everything we do in life requires faith most times when it comes to faith, I'm not sure if you're like me, but I tend not to read the manual. So I get in the car and then I put the key in the ignition and uh, the car can do things that I don't know that it does. Or I forget that it can do certain things. And so I forget that the car maybe has a GPS or that I can connect my cell phone 
to the car. And so in the process, it becomes a little bit difficult for me. And I begin to realize that I need to read the manual. And so what we're doing today is when we come to the Word of God, is we're reading the manual. And in reading the manual, I may just bring music down a little, Gav. But when we read the manual and we go to Romans chapter 10, verse 6. I want to speak to you about what God says to us. But the righteousness of faith speaks this way. So the Bible's addressing how we speak. Now we know that faith, without faith it is impossible to please God. And faith has a certain language. It speaks a certain way. It isn't a faith that is just a foolish faith. I don't just foolishly stand on this platform. I'm aware of the structure and I'm aware of the strength. And so I'm aware that when I place my bodily weight on this platform, this platform will not only hold me, it'll hold the piano, it'll hold a choir, it'll hold a whole lot of people. Therefore, I know there is structural integrity. And when we put our faith into the Word of God, there is structural integrity. So the Bible is talking about you and I, now that we are born again, says we are the righteousness of God in Christ, which means we have a right relationship with God. He loves us. We love Him. And so these words sometimes are big words that we see in the book of Romans, like righteousness and justification and sanctification, and we get confused. But the word righteousness just means to be right with God. So it says those that are right with God speak this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up. But then he goes on to say, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, what is he saying to us? He said, don't look to try and bring Jesus from the throne of glory to where you are. Neither are you trying to reach into the nethermost parts of the earth to bring Christ up. We are not trying to bring Jesus into our circumstance. The scripture is clear. Now that you are born of the Spirit, He is living in you. That's why the Bible says, greater is He that is in you. So we are instructed how to speak. It says the righteousness of which is of faith. We're not trying to bring Jesus out and say, you're a recluse, if only you would hear me. Many of the old hymn writers would write songs like, reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. Well, that would have been relevant living in the Old Testament because the woman with an issue of blood had to reach out and touch Jesus to be healed. But now that you've received him into your heart, he is only a breath away, a prayer away. He is the greater one living on the inside of you. So we are encouraged not to endeavor to bring Jesus into the circumstance, but to recognize that he's near us in our heart and in our mouth. Then he gives us the solution that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, this is the core of the gospel. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. For the rest of your life as a Christian, you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. What you believe, you will speak about. And if you don't believe in it, you won't speak about it. So I believe and then I confess. So if someone said to me, Pastor Nev, do you believe that a parachute would carry you from an airplane as you plummeted out the door and flew towards the ground? I would say, I believe it. But then they would say, well, if you believe it, they may push it a step further and say, can we put a parachute on you and throw you out of the plane and I'd say well I, I believe it can carry me because I see it has carried others and many times our faith is in what God has done for others but there's a point where you have to jump out of the plane yourself and the parachute has to open for you personally I remember hang gliding many years ago and I jumped 
off the edge of a very high mountain near the, near the Drakensberg. And I had a bunch of crazy friends. There were eight of us. And out of the eight of us, I think two of us are still alive. And uh, most of us are not here because of the things we did. And so we would take one of the farm vehicles and we would drive up onto the side in a farm, one of the farmer's homes, they graciously allow us up. One of us would drive and we would drop off seven and then we'd go down to wait at the bottom. And we'd drive at the top of the mountain and seven of us would set up our hang gliders and then run and launch ourselves off the side of a 1,500 meters, 2,000 meter mountain and plummet towards the ground. Now, the scary thing about a hang glider is that we all know that a wing of an aeroplane, a wing will carry you. We believe in it, but faith requires some action. And I never forget the first time I set up my hang glider and my friend said to me, you'll be fine, don't worry about it, just run. Well, the first problem is you can't run fast enough to get enough air under the wings to pick you up. The second part is there's a point where you have finished your running and you're coming to the edge of a cliff and you literally hurl yourself off. Now logic tells me to lift the wing up and to look to the sky. But if I'm going to fly, I actually point the wing down the side of the mountain and plummet down the side of the mountain to gain speed. And as I gain speed, then I'd flare the wing of the hang glider up and it would pick me up and then lift me up way, way, way above the mountain. And if you were good enough, you could circle the hang glider like a bird and then you'd fly it all the way down to the bottom. And when you landed, you had to land pretty much like a bird. You had to lift the wing up to the sky and then settle it down so your feet could touch the ground and you'd hit the ground with your feet running. Now, if you got it right, you could settle it down perfectly. But i never forget the first time I hurled off the top of a mountain. I realized suddenly that I was at least three, four hundred meters above the ground. There was no way down. I was reliant on this wing to carry me. I had to have faith in an aluminum structure covered with sail material, stitched together by someone's hand. I had to have faith that when I bolted that hang glider together and strapped myself in, that I was correctly strapped in. There was no way out. I was committed and I knew I'd have to fly or die so I flew and of course I'm still here but I never forget that first flight I landed the flight and when I landed it at the bottom I was so afraid I couldn't get my helmet off and I was slapping myself on my own head with my helmet because my hand was shaking so much I, I was terrified it didn't stop me flying it just made me want to go higher and do it again and again and again, as I said, there were eight of us and there were two of us left. I'm still here. I quit hang gliding while I was ahead. But here what the Bible tells us, that faith requires us to believe in our heart and to confess with my mouth. The story of the hang glider was simple. I believed my friends that a hang glider could fly. I'd heard their confession, but then I purchased my own hang glider. And so now I believe in my heart and confess with my own mouth and declare with my own mouth that I understand what it means to fly a hang glider off the side of a mountain. And once you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand what it is to receive God into your heart. But the rest of your Christian life will continue with these acts, which many people think are daring. But in actual fact, they're not daring at all. Because provided you're in the safety and the security of the Word of God, you will be all right. Now let's go back and we're going to continue to walk through and look at this area of faith. So we know that with faith, we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth, which we've just been reading. Now you will notice when you go back to Romans chapter 1, to Romans chapter 1, Paul writes this, and I'm going to verse 16. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So what is faith all about? Faith, firstly, is about the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. So the first thing we know when we believe in our heart 
and we confess with our mouth, God has heard your prayer where you've said, Jesus, come into my heart, make me a new creature. And so we understand here from Romans chapter 1 that he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we're not ashamed of Christ because knowing Jesus is the power of God to salvation. Now you'll discover that as you walk through the book of Romans, in Romans 1, the first thing Paul says is, do not be ashamed to be a believer. Then in Romans chapter 2, he tells us, do not allow your conscience to accuse you in verse 15. And I'm only highlighting this. In Romans chapter 3, he encourages us to understand that we have been forgiven in verse 25 through the blood or through faith in his blood. So you'll find that my faith and my confession are based in the fact and the reality that Jesus rose from the dead. My faith is in his blood. I wrote a little thing here in my Bible, and it simply says this. It says, the law manages you, but grace justifies you. So what takes place when through faith we believe in God? Our sins are forgiven. You see, laws are designed to manage you. But the grace of God that forgives us doesn't manage us. Simply, God doesn't judge us. The grace of God makes us. And the grace of God doesn't only redeem us, but justifies us. That means God acquits us of all guilt. So when I begin to walk through the book of Romans, Paul writes and he says, I'm not ashamed. Then he says in chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, we have a conscience that either accuses us or excuses us. But God still speaks to us in his heart. Then in chapter 3, he says, when we have faith in his blood, we have not only been acquitted of all guilt, but our relationship has been made right with God. Then we walk into chapter 4, and when we walk into chapter 4, he carries on the discussion, and his discussion in the book of Romans is about trying to live legalistically or trying to live by faith. And in chapter 4, he says, if anyone had any place to brag, it would have been Abraham, because Abraham believed God. See, I told you the story about the hang glider. I believed that the hang glider would carry me. Abraham believed God, as did Sarah, for a child. And the Bible said his believing was accounted to him for righteousness. And it is an accounting term. It says when he believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. And what that required of Abraham was that he left the Ur of the Chaldees. When you're born again, leaving the Ur of the Chaldees, you say, well, I didn't leave the Ur of the Chaldees. Well, what Abraham did was he left heathen society and began to follow God, serve God, and live for God. He began to listen to the voice of the Spirit of God. And so he goes on a faith journey. And it's going to take him a while to find the place that God has provided for him. It's going to take a while before the promised child will be given to him. But he believes God. And in believing God, not only is his family blessed, but everyone around him is blessed. You see, your faith in God will do exactly what Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says. And I want to encourage you, and I'm walking a little bit through the book of Romans, but in Romans 5 verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith. What is the whole point of him telling us to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth? God wants you to know that not only are you righteous, right with God, a right relationship, knowing that you can love Him with all your heart, mind, and soul, knowing that He loves you back, 
not only can you love Him, but you are justified. And that's again another big word. It means you are acquitted of all guilt, just as though it never happened. This acquittal means there is no record of any wrongdoing. There is no record of any sin committed. There is no record of your past. There is no one who can point a finger at you and say, Oh, I know you. And I know how you behaved. And I know what you did last year. And I know all about you. I know where you hang out. I know how you treat your wife. I know, I know, I know. Isn't it funny? There are a lot of know-it-alls in the world who don't know too much. But that's beside the point. God looks at him and he says, listen, before you were even born, I knew you. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew all about you. I knew where you'd live. I knew who your parents were. I knew the day and the age in which you live. I would give you strength for the day and the age in which you live. I would provide for you in the day and age in which you live. And if you'll follow me and walk by faith and not by sight, I will provide for you. And so we find in Romans chapter 5, it says we have access because we're acquitted. One of our greatest challenges as believers is to know we have access to God Almighty. We're reminded, firstly, don't try and bring Him down or bring Him up. Don't try and beg and plead for Jesus to come into your situation. It says He's near you, in your heart and in your mouth. That means if you love God with all of your heart, with all the emotional passion, with all of your being, you love God. Then your mouth will line up with your heart. Now when you come into His presence, you are not condemned. You're in right relationship. You are not guilty. You're in right relationship. Your past is completely acquitted. It never happened. I love this story, and it's a story that's been told many, many, many times. And I happened to have preached in the building a number of times where the great Catherine Kuhlman had preached. And there were two doors that led into this auditorium or the sanctuary. And I was told by people who were with her. And so I only have their story to go on. And I believe them because they were people who told the truth. And they said to me, she would walk to the doors of this great auditorium. And when she would walk to the doors of these great auditoriums before she entered, she would commit herself to Jesus. And then she would remind people. People would try to remind her about her past. And she, there was a wonderful book written about her called Daughter of Destiny. And in that book, people criticized her about finance and all kinds of things and, and her flamboyance on the platform and many, many things. But as she stood at those doors, she would declare, I'm forgiven. I'm right with God. It never happened. One of her favorite sayings was, it never happened. And I want you to know your past. It never happened. Whatever people said, it never happened. When Jesus died at Calvary, made you righteous, cleansed you from all of your sin, He looks at you and I. And he forgives us. And he says, it never happened. So regardless of what has taken place in your life today, regardless of what you're facing the world with, it never happened. Now, if I say it never happened, then I can say I have access, which is Romans chapter 5. I don't walk into the presence of God with cap in hand saying it happened. Catherine could have walked in and said, I went through a divorce, but she had said it never happened. She could have walked in and said her financial manager did some foolish things, which he did, but she said it never happened. Someone would say, well, Pastor Nev, that's living in denial. No, we don't live in denial. We live knowing that Jesus took our past, removed it once and for all. 
And every accusation, every lie of the enemy, every torment that comes against, from, against you, you can look back at your past, even your yesterday, knowing that you're right with God, acquitted of all guilt. It never happened. And you have access to come boldly to the throne of grace and find grace to help in the time of need. That means you can come to God and find unequivocal favor. Unequivocal favor. Doesn't matter whether you've been a Christian for a long time or a short time. God extends unequivocal favor to you and says, my grace, my favor is sufficient for you. Let's pray together. Father, as we've gathered in this place today and I've shared your word, I thank you that we walk by faith. Our vision is determined by the faith you've put in us. We see what you have said in your word. You've said you will supply for us. You will protect us. You will provide for us. You will heal us. You said you forgive us. We thank you that we are forgiven. We're acquitted of all guilt. We have access to come to your throne. So we refuse to live in any place where we are condemned. We say boldly, we are not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. Amen. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Right now, people need good news. I'm Pastor Nev, and as I've shared the word with you, and I've prayed with you, there's enough bad news out there to sink all the battleships in the world. Let's not be spreaders of bad news, but let's encourage people with good news. Get on the telephone, call your neighbors, call your friends, call your family, call everyone you know. Get on your WhatsApp, your text, whatever it is that you do, and send them a scripture, something encouraging. Share the good news. Let them know that you're praying for them, you care about them, and there is a good God who loves them. Amen. Now, Father, I thank you that as we meet and we worship you, that your grace, your mercy, and peace rests upon you, us. I thank you. You said you'll never leave us or forsake us. So I declare that each person will sense your mighty presence. In Jesus' name, amen. You're blessed. Don't forget to join us in our evening service and at the various worship services that we have. I'm Pastor Nev and Pastor Wendy and I love you. God bless you.